Hi students, welcome back. Today we're going to talk about the normal curve, we're going to talk about probability, and we're going to talk about how we estimate the likelihood of scores in our distribution relative to the normal curve. So let's get started. To begin with, we want to talk today about what probability is. And to do that, we're going to start with some basic rules of probability, and we're going to think about how those rules of probability help us understand probability distributions. That'll lead to a discussion about the normal curve, the normal distribution, and standardized scores, which will tell us how far away from the mean any observation is and tell us the probability of that outcome under the normal curve. And finally, we're actually going to try and find some probabilities under the normal curve. So let's begin. To begin with, what we want to do is understand what probability is. And probability is the relative likelihood of an occurrence of any given outcome or any given event. So you can imagine the probability of an event being the likelihood of observing such an event over the total number of trials. So for example, let's say that you were flipping a coin and you flipped a coin and you flipped a coin and you flipped a coin and you were trying to figure out the probability of heads. Well, if you figured it out, you would say, okay, I'm going to get a head one in every two times that I flip my coin. So the probability of getting a head is 0.5. And we can think of the probability of an event formalized as event A equaling the frequency of event A divided by the total number of trials. There are a number of basic rules when thinking about probability, all of which can be applied to understanding probability and probability curves. The converse rule determines the probability that something will not occur. The formula for the converse rule says that the probability of not being event A is equal to 1 minus the probability of event A. So imagine that event A has a 30% chance of happening. All this is saying is that you take 100 and subtract 30, and essentially there's a 70% chance that it, that event will not happen if there's a 30% chance that it does happen. The addition rule is a rule that helps us understand cumulative probabilities by adding probabilities to, together. For example, let's say that you were playing cards and you were wondering, what's the probability of getting a heart or a diamond. Well, if we can understand that there's four suits of cards in a deck of cards, so there's a one in four chance of each, then the probability of getting a heart or a diamond would be a one in four chance plus a one in four chance or a one in two chance. The multiplication rule combines independent outcomes and, it's a pro and it produces a product of their separate probabilities. For example, if I'm flipping coins again and again and again, and I wanted to know the probability of flipping a head on the first time, I would understand that that probability is 0 0.5, or there's a 1 in 2 chance that I observe a head on the first time I flip the coin. But if I said, what's the probability of getting two heads in a row, we would use the multiplication rule, and my probability then becomes 0 0.5 times 0 0.5, or 0 0.25, or a 1 in 4 chance that I observe two heads in a row. So, Let's think about this here. So let's say that we have an experiment where we flip three coins in a row and we imagine all the possible outcomes of this space. You know, so let's say what's the probability of observing any possible outcomes? What's the probability of getting one head? What's the probability of getting two heads? And what's the probability of getting three heads when we run this experiment? And as we arrange this, you can imagine that there's only one possible outcome that gets you three tails or three heads. Right? You would have to get three heads sequentially when you do this experiment, or you'd have to get three tails sequentially. And then there's three different possibilities that would produce each of two heads or two tails. So you can see in the second column here, where we have head, tail, 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 head, tail, 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 head. These are the three different ways that you could observe one head when you run the experiment. And similarly, the third column, tail, head, 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 tail, head, 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 tail, are the three different ways you could observe two heads. So these eight different outcomes would then have associated probabilities. One of the eight outcomes, for example, produces three tails. So one divided by eight is 0 0.125. Therefore, there's a 1.25 probability of observing three tails. Similarly, if there's a 0 0.375 probability of observing one head, a 0 0.375 probability of observing two heads, and a 0 0.125 probability of observing three heads. Now let's stop a moment. Let's think about an application of a number of the rules that we just learned. For example, the converse rule. If we know that there's a 0 0.125 probability of observing three tails, what's the probability 
of not observing three tails, that would be 1 minus 0 0.125 or 0 0.875. There's an application of the converse rule. We could also see an application of the addition rule. What's the probability of observing either three heads or two heads? We would then add probabilities, and you can see the two-head probability is 0 0.375 plus the three-head probability, 0 0.125, that would give us a probability of 0 0.5, or a 50-50 chance that we would observe two or three heads. Terrific! We can also, finally, see an application of the multiplication rule in this simple distribution. For example, if we know that any one outcome, or, or any one time we flip a coin, we have a 0.5 probability of getting a head, we can very quickly see the probability of getting three heads. It would be 0 0.5 times 0 0.5 times 0 0.5 or 0 0.125. And if you look in the third column, the probability of observing three heads is a 1 in 8 chance, or the probability is 0 0.125. So you can see all of the different rules of probability operating simultaneous. Now when we establish a theoretical probability distribution, I want you to think of them as being similar to frequency distributions that we've covered earlier in the class. We can determine the expected value of a distribution by summing the product of the values of an observation by the probability that that observation occurs. So for example, the value, if we want to know how many heads we would reasonably expect on three sequential flips, we could take the value of heads that we could possibly observe in this experimental space, the zero heads, the one heads, the two heads, and the three heads, and then multiply them by the probability which, which they occur. When we add up those values times probabilities, we get an average, and that average is our theoretical expected value. So we would expect to observe 1.5 heads every time we ran this three coin flipping experiment. I realize that you can never actually observe uh, 1.5 heads when you flip a coin three times, but the long run average of this experiment would predict that you should observe 1.5 heads. Notice that half the observations are above the 1.5 point and half the observations are below the 1.5. That's not at all surprising and in fact it conforms to our understanding of what's called a probability distribution and it leads us to our understanding of the idea of expected value. The expected value of any sample we observe is the population value or the population mean. So the, pop the theoretical population mean that we could derive from this distribution of heads for our three coin flip experiment is 1.5 and any time we run the experiment we expect to observe 1.5 heads. Notice that the bell shaped curve looks very similar to our coin flipping experiment. It's divided in the center, half the observations would be above the mean, half the observations would be below the mean. It's a perfectly symmetrical distribution and it's unimodal, i.e. there's a single mode in the center of the distribution. The mean, the median, the mode all share the same values. And you'll notice as you taper off towards the end, in theory, we get closer and closer to touching the line, but it never actually re reaches the horizon. Distance away from the mean for a normal distribution curve is measured in standard deviations. So when we understand as we move away from the mean, in a positive direction or to the right, we're moving positive standard deviations away from the mean. And when we move to the left, we're moving negative standard deviations away from the mean. Or we're observing values that are less than the mean. We can use the normal curve to develop our understanding of the probabilities of an event happening. If we can understand how many standard deviation units away from the mean any individual observation is, the area from that point either to one end of the curve or the other end of the curve will have a probability associated with it. So if I'm one standard deviation above the mean, there's a probability of observing a score equal to what I observe or higher. And similarly, there's a probability of observing a score at that point or lower. The sum of the probabilities under the curve will always sum to one. Here's a distribution that's not normal. This is an actual observed distribution. The normal distribution is just a theoretical distribution. And when we observe populations or samples, they rarely conform to the normal distribution curve. You know, many distributions are skewed or multimodal, not bell-shaped in any way. 
Nevertheless, 100% of, of your observations are going to fall at some point underneath the distribution generated by your observations. We can use a normal probability table to determine the probability of observing values higher or lower than an observed standard deviation away from our mean. The distance in standard deviation units away from the mean is what's called a z-score or a standard score and it indicates both the direction and, and the degree to which any raw score deviates from the mean. It's distance in standard deviation units. Directions also tell us if we have a negative value that means we, we've observed an observation that's below our mean. And if we have a positive value, the observation that we're interested in is above our mean. We can use the formula z equals x minus mu over sigma as a generalized form, where mu is the mean of the theoretical distribution, sigma is the standard deviation of a distribution, and z is a standard score. This is the generalized form for population value. We can use the z-score to determine precisely how many standard deviations away from the mean any individual observation is. So this is a normal distribution probability table. And you can see from the title of the table that this is the normal distribution probability of not being in the right-hand tail, or it's telling us the left-hand tail. And if you look at the diagram to the right of the table, you can see that the blue part is the right-hand tail, and the not blue part of the table, or the white part, part of, the, of the chart, excuse me, is the left-hand tail. The blue part signifies that we have a probability of essentially 5% of whatever this event is happening. And below the blue part, you can see that what we have is 1.645. That's the z-score, the positive z-score away from the mean, or above the mean, of an observation that would leave a 5% chance of something happening. So you see the area in the right-hand tail up in the subheading, is P equals 0 0.05, and down below the area of the curve not in the right-hand tail, therefore an application of the converse law, is P equals 0 0.95. So if there's a 95% chance that something doesn't happen, there's a 5% chance that something does happen, and vice versa. Now, as you look at the table, let's look at the z-score associated with 1.645. So the z-scores are the leftmost column and the top row of numbers. And so the z-score only goes to the second decimal point, and you can see, so the, the leftmost column, you can see that we would go down to 1.6, and then across the top row, across to somewhere between 4 and 5. And all the numbers inside this table are the probabilities of events happening. And in this case, as I said, it's the probability of not being in the left, er, not being in the right-hand tail. So at 1.64, you can see that the probability is 0 0.9495, and at 1.65, the probability is 0 0.9505. So the probability of not being in the right-hand tail that would produce a 0 0.95 is somewhere between 1.64 and 1.65. So the probability that would leave 5% in the right-hand tail would have a z-score of 1.645. I'm just going to take a calculator out, and let's take a look at this problem here. So now, let's say that we were trying to observe a score of 7 in a probability distribution with a mean of 4.5 and a standard deviation of 1.8. So I would use the formula that we're now already familiar with from the previous slide, but now I want you to think of this in sample world. The formula is now going to say x minus x bar over s, or the observation that we're interested in, minus the mean divided by the standard deviation will produce the z-score that we're looking for. So in this case, I'm just simply in my calculator. I know you can't see this, but trust me, I'm doing it in my calculator. I'm taking my 7 minus 4.5 divided by 1.8. And you can try this on your own. What I get is 1.388. So I'm going to round that to 1.39. And I can see going down the column here, to 1.3, and then all the way across to 9, I have a 0 0.9177 probability. So my probability of observing a score of 7 or lower would be a 91.77% chance. And my likelihood of observing a score of 7 or higher, I would then apply the converse rule because I'm now looking for what's in the right-hand tail. And so I would subtract from 1 
0.9177, and so the probability of that event is 0.0823, or there's about an 8.23% chance that you observe a score of 7 or higher given these uh, statistics for our distribution. Terrific. So what we've covered in, in this lecture is developed a basic understanding of probability and some of the rules of probability. We've taken a look at generally probability distributions, but particularly the normal curve. We started to develop some understanding of standardized scores, and we played around with finding the probability under the, under the curve. Good start. Let's move on to our next video as soon as we get a chance, which is going to be on the central limit theorem, the law of large numbers, and how we can do statistical inference. It's the basis for the standard error. We'll see you soon.